All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Welcome to Barn Talk. What happens at the barn stays at the barn. And as hot as it's been, you couldn't keep it in there anyway. So we're going to let it all out. We're going to let it all out today. I'm your host, Torque, and this is my sidekick, Sawyer. And today is going to be a special one. We got a, we got a guest on today. I think it's going to drop a lot of value for you guys. But before we get into that, we're going to do a quick market update. Dad's going to give you a quick one. So, Dad... Take it over. We're going to make it concise and short today because we got a lot of ground to cover. So uh, southeast Iowa, the the grains have gone up and they've come back and now they're kind of not looking so hot. Uh, corn 634 and it doesn't make much difference if you haul it to the feed mill or haul it to the river. It's about 630, 634. Beans are 1391 and I think that's river price. That's about the best there is. And hogs are about 110, right where they've been. Cattle are 120. Bitcoin. Is this new? Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Is, is not doing well. It's come off its low. The last time I checked, it was 33.3. So it got all the way down to 32. And I don't know, it just can't seem to break out. And uh, Tesla, last time I checked, it was 560 or 652. It'll come so, around. Bitcoin, Bitcoin will come around. It's it's just it's just it's just playing right here. Just gotta wait. We're just waiting it. Gotta it gotta gotta be for the long run. Gotta be for the long time run. Time in the market. Time in the market. Or are we gonna break the stock to flow model? <laughs> <laughs> it's about to be broken. That's right. That's right. All right, guys. So now it's time to show you who's who's on the show today. It's gonna be a special one. He is the face of a well-known video game YouTube channel known as The Squad. He posts footage and commentary about the game Farming Simulator for more than 1.2 million subscribers. Wow. He also has a personal YouTube channel where he documents his journey of starting, a farm starting farming from scratch and chasing his childhood dream of farming. He also graduated from Iowa State University with a degree in ag business um, if that isn't enough, he is also the founder and CEO of GSL Holdings, a Bitcoin mining farm in Iowa. That's an awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Grant Hilbert. Not CEO. Not CEO. Part, part, part owner, part, part owner, partner. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know for sure. I did some research. That sounded a lot cooler than it is. It, <laughs> it's, it's pretty impressive though, dude. I will have to say that is awesome that you're even doing that. That that I don't know very many people that are even in that. So yeah, yeah. I definitely, w I definitely want to touch on that a little bit later in the show. But that's that's very impressive. Welcome to the show, buddy. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, guys. Glad, glad that Driving you're here. From Ankeny to Washington County. Yep, yep. And I got out here thinking uh, Washington, kind of southeast Iowa, wasn't much, and it's. You guys got good ground out here. Yeah. It's oh, yeah. It's Shh, pretty. Don't be telling people that. <laughs> just drive. The, be coming. Just drive the price up. <laughs> it's already pretty expensive, but yeah, dude. Where can people find you if they get value from the show? So, uh, main things. That, well, if you're a young kid, if you're like 12 years old, you can watch me on uh, YouTube, the Squad. Okay. Um, or I try to make videos kind of more for older folks who might be into farming more, uh, which would be just Grant Hilbert on YouTube, just. I think I only have like 16 videos, but just kind of document the journey of getting started uh, farming on YouTube. Yep. So, and That's then awesome. uh, Instagram is just the squad underscore YouTube. Okay. It's, it's turned from the gaming side to more farming. So I need to change the name from the so squad. So you're doing, you're doing a little bit of both on your Instagram of, yeah, yeah. or you were at least, but now it's turned into your personal kind of. Yeah. The thing that was always weird is gaming is, it's tough to post gaming photos on Instagram. Right. So yeah. I've tr transitioned to farming. It's yeah. Fun. That's awesome. Well, if, yeah, guys, if you get any value from the show and you want to follow Grant on anything, check him out, check out his YouTube, check out his Instagram, give him a follow, hit him, hit the subscribe button. And also if you get any value from this show, all we ask for you guys to do is share out the show, share it to a coworker, share it to your family members, share it to friends, that's the that's the ticket of admission to watch the show. That's all we ask. So help help me out. I'm getting older every Dad day, also, so time's not on my side. <laughs> Dad also wants some snacks, so send us some more snacks if you can. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna get into the nitty gritty. We're gonna get into the nitty gritty, okay. Grant. Okay. So 
I want to know personally, what were you, what was your childhood like? What made you want to become a farmer? Because was it, do you have somebody in your family that's, that's yeah. a farmer, you know, or did you look out in the field one day and you were like, I want a piece of that? No, it was, uh, I was connected into agriculture. So I wasn't a, a farm boy, but my grandparents, so they farmed in Northern Iowa, uh, around the outgoing area. So Southern Kasuth County. And uh, they farmed 1,500, 2,000 acres. And so I lived in Ankeny, which is central Iowa. That's yep. two and a half hours away. But uh, I was, when I was a young kid, I was just up there all the time, kind of. And so you'd go up on the weekends, stuff like that. Heck, I remember being in Ankeny, uh, I would have been like 10 years old. And I remember we couldn't, like you would wait all fall to be able to go up for harvest and stuff yep. like that. You'd sit in class, daydream all that. And heck, I remember not being able to go up one fall and just like bowling my eyes out, just like wanted it so bad. Yeah. 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 And I think that was like, you know, 2009, it was the fun years and stuff like that. So yeah, I grew up around the farm and, uh, uh, it was, it's kind of a situation where people are like, well, why don't you just jump into the family farm? Obviously they'll let you in and stuff. And it's kind of a thing with family where, a lot of the families always, they're always fighting yeah. right, about who's going to own land. So from my dad's side, it was like, it's going to be tough for you to kind of yep. jump in there. So then I was like, okay, well, you know, how do we start farming? I guess, do you rent farms kind of around Ankeny? Do you do this? And so uh, it would have been 2014. I started the squad YouTube channel. Uh, you know, that gave me a little money to be able to purchase some low quality farms and yep. start farming. So that's kind of how it was. And, uh, yeah, as a child, I just always dreamed and dreamed of farming and yep. it was just, how are you going to start? Right. So. That's the biggest challenge with people that want to become a first generation farmer. Yeah. Guys, if you didn't know this, Grant is kind of a first gen generation farmer. Yeah. Like you literally started from scratch yeah. pretty much. I mean, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very, very hard. If you're not, if you're not somebody familiar with agriculture, that is like very challenging. And the you, cost of admission is very is tough. Yeah. And uh, the supply of land is like the supply of Bitcoin. It's finite. It and is. So there's not any more being made. In fact, urban sprawl, there's less all the time. So yeah. it's a tough, it's a tough point of entry. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Farmland's, uh, interesting. It's, I almost think it's better than Bitcoin. As sort it, of a, oh, for I, sure. I, I, I agree. Hurt. When you think about it. I agree. Oh, for sure. You know, they're not making any more of it. Yeah. You know, well, and, and I, so many people, there was a time, there was a time through the 70s and 80s, well, going long way back, where there was only a, lim a limited number of people that saw the potential of farmland, and it was looked at as the only reason you own farmland was if you were a farmer and you wanted to, you know, feed your family and, and be a farmer. Today, starting, starting in the 90s, it's the secret is out, and now then you have it's it is a it's an investment just like commercial real estate residential real estate where there's outside people that given the opportunity and the numbers work they're going to be there bidding against the guy that's looking at you know expanding his farming operation they're looking at it purely as an investment and so that's just added fuel to the fire and and I think when you look through this the last few years when the economy hasn't been that great just like the stock market, the economy hasn't been that good, but man, land prices, they haven't missed a beat. They, missed they just beat keep at all. They just keep they just going keep up going. and up. I can't imagine what it'll be when I'm your age. Yeah. <laughs> it always brings up the question, like why would you own gold when you can just own the farmland? That's gold, gold that kicks off a yield. Exactly. Right? So, that's exactly yeah, that's right. That's a good point. That's a good point for sure. But uh, yeah, we got farmland denominated in fiat debt. That poses an interesting question that, or sorry, fiat dollars. That yep. poses an interesting question of, is farmland really going up in value or are we just depreciating the uh, dollar that much too? Right. Over the past years. So well, I think you're, I mean, I think, I think we're all in the same wavelength there because <laughs> yes. if you look at, it is doing the same thing as, as stocks, you know, if you, um, if you look at the, the money that's been printed and the money supply versus the return on, or the increase in value of farmland or stock, the S and P 500 or whatever, uh, the only thing I think yeah. this is right. The only two things that if you put those lines together on the same graph, 
the only assets that have outperformed outperformed tech are, stocks tech stocks and bitcoin crypto He's yeah like, crypto bitcoin especially but mm-hmm. crypto. but i'd be surprised they might not have looked at land on that yeah yeah because not the thing with that is like not everybody can buy right. land so maybe it's they, so variable you know but i agree i think that you're right i think it's a case that our currency is getting devalued and so anybody that can put their money in what we would call a hard asset that's what they're doing yeah so yeah. so when you price uh at pomp goes on this all the time but yeah. when you price s p or anything in gold it's it's pretty flat even though it looks like we're going parabolic right now yep. it's pretty flat yep so yeah. over the past decade or two decades so right. the other question another question i had was i say you're in a lot of a lot of things you know you're in a, you're you're kind of a hustler i would definitely say and do you consider yourself an on, entrepreneur and all the stuff that you're doing and if so like, are you doing all this stuff just to get you to the dream of being a farmer? And then once you get to that point, are you going to be like, all the other stuff I'm doing, I just kind of want to just say, screw it. I just want to farm. I'm done. I just want to be here and yeah. got my dream. No, or I, are you a purebred, like you just love the game of everything that you do? No, I would say definitely a huge goal is to someday become a farmer where it sounds big, but you can own a lot of land and you can farm. But I feel like once you get there, there's going to be, or if, if I get there, there's going to be, oh, you will. There, there's going to be opportunities where you see different investments that are probably going to return better than the farm. And so right. you chase those, but there will also be there. I think there will also always be like a, a part-time farmer. Eventually I'd like to get it full-time and do kind of part-time like entrepreneurial stuff. Right. But right. Yeah. I feel like, uh, eventually the journey is to try and get there yeah. trying to get there yeah. and just the rest of the stuff just be like yeah I'm, I, I got here i'm here i just yeah. want to enjoy it enjoy it now yeah that's so awesome right now just trying to do as many different projects go out on the risk curve a little bit with time and money yep. and kind of see where you can get in the next 10 years yeah that's awesome dude <laughs> yeah and i mean the other side of the farm deal is you got to be you always got to be growing it because if you're not if you're not growing a little bit you're going backwards and like What I like to tell people is we're full-time hog farmers and we're part-time grain farmers because the grain farming, we love it, but it really doesn't, we're not at the scale that it returns massively for us. The hogs are what pay the bills and hopefully a few other things that we're doing are going to pay some bills too. But I think we have the same, you know, I was just, I'm very lucky. We're very lucky that somehow we're able to, we've been able to raise another generation off 400 acres. Mm -hmm. Well, I can guarantee you he's not going to be able to raise another generation off 400 acres unless we're doing a lot of other stuff very, very well. Right. And so, yeah, yeah. that's, I'm right there with you. You know, that's my goal too, is like, I'm doing all these things. I do, I do love entrepreneurship. I love business and farming. Just, just about the same. Like I think I'll always do business and farming, but yeah, I really want to grow our grain farming operation. I mean, that's every farm farm kid's yeah. dreams to have the big big stuff. And and this poses a question: Is this where farming is going? To where everybody's going to be hustling a lot more outside, or maybe that's how it always was back in the '80s, where people were hustling just to fund the grain farm. Mm-hmm. It's oh, get, margins are going to get tighter, 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 and tighter. I hundred percent agree. You're going to have a few guys. I think you'll still have a f- there's and like like it is today there's some guys that farm a massive amount of ground and they've got it structured and they have, they're good enough managers when it comes to the part-time help and all that, that they can make that work. And literally their goal is they want to farm like that, be able to run new equipment. They go to the Ozarks in the summertime. They go to the commodity classic in the wintertime and go to, go to the Dominican and they got their wife works somewhere that has health care and real insurance. Mm-hmm. That's all they want. That's yeah. and, and that's well, what their more dad. More power to them. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's, more power to them. It's like if you're happy with where you're at and you love, you know, you love the size of your farm and you're content with it. More power to you. I want uh, I want Clay and Sawyer to do very well. And I tag along like I have these dreams, too. All I really want for them to get to the point that they can say, Dad, I got you a really nice, one of those really nice swivel koozies on the mower. And uh, you you just mow, if you just mow everything, we'll take care of everything else. <laughs> That's what I'm working towards. <laughs> I, my dreams and aspirations. Are- yeah, he always, he always jokes to me. He's like, 
anytime we talk about the future of hog hog barns and the stuff in our hog barns break in or anything, <laughs> yeah. he's like, Oh, well that's not my problem. Ten that's years, your problem. That's, that'll okay. be Sawyer's okay. problem. So he'll yeah. just have to deal with all yeah. that. So I guess I'm gonna have to just everything that my dad cobbled together, he would get get it done and he'd look at me and he'd go, Well, that ought to last me as long as I need it. <laughs> <laughs> and now that I'm re- I'm reaping all of the all the problems to come. So that's all part of it. But getting back to your point, I think that you're going to have a few people that are able to do that. And I think everybody else, unless you're at a pretty grand scale, you're going to have to have some other line of income Mm -hmm. to help you be able. And the other thing, I mean, I don't want to get off too far, is I'm a little bit up in the air. Is all of our equipment going to keep getting bigger? Or is it all going to get a lot smaller and a lot smarter to where instead of having, you know, 24 row planter, are you going to have three, eight row planters on a tractor that nobody drives that you just load your maps on and your goes. iPad, and just let her eat. I mean, that's an interesting question. Are we at max scale of equipment yeah. right now? Are we at peak? Yeah. And I mean, honestly, that, that might help, uh, you know, first gen farmers get in easier if it goes that way. Cause it's not so much money to buy a little a little tractor and a smaller planter, you know. I mean, it's still expensive. Every time I see own. that Sabato, is it Sabato? There's, I see those guys go out every spring and every fall, and they've got like three Kubota tractors. I've with, seen that. Yeah, yeah. I think they're open cab, small ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and they, you know, they're pretty. It's pretty interesting. I do feel like it's going to go that way. The, uh, the lazy thing, harvest though, it's like you yeah. still got to have the combine, you still got to have the semis, you still got to have. All the, that good stuff. the lazy part of me kind of likes the idea of sitting at the coffee shop while my corn gets planted. I kind of like that. I do like I do like being in the fields. So. You feel like there will be guys that just want to farm though, want to drive. Oh, the track. guaranteed. Okay, guaranteed. Yeah. yeah, and I also feel like it will get to the point where those people will get left behind because they just want to do it the old way. And It'll, the people, it's always whoever adopts the technology and yeah. runs with it is the one that reaps the most benefit out of it. I feel like. You know, if you adopt the technology that's given, that's out there fast and first, and the guys that don't. It will be a generational thing. So I think you'll see, I think as the technology gets there that you can do that, and at the price point that you can scale it, there'll be people that take advantage of it, and they'll farm a lot of ground with very little labor because that's their limiting factor. Uh, It's so hard to find. And you'll see guys that look at that like guys looked at uh when the first uh twin city tractor got dropped in jackson township and there were guys like i wouldn't have one of them you know these horses i'm gonna farm with horses till the day i die and they did and then nobody else followed in their footsteps i mean i think it's the same thing um we talk about it all the time technology it's it's easy to resist anything. You look at it. We don't. We don't like change. As as human beings, it's programmed into us that when we get something the way we like it, we like to keep it that way. We don't like change. But at some point, you've got to decide. You either adapt or you get shoved to the get on the train side. or get ran over. Pretty right. much. That's what I and I think. Say. I think that's the way that'll be. What's crazy is in twenty seventy, so fifty years from now. If this video is still on YouTube, somebody's <laughs> yes. going to come back and watch this video right. and be like, we're going to be Torque looking like right. geniuses. Torque was so right. Let's see. Or 70 Torque years. So if I, if I go to Panama and get the stem cells and given my level of income and the healthcare advi- advancements, I might be in a bed somewhere going, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope you make it. <laughs> I don't know. You might be hoping, gosh, come on, dad, just give it up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Got I, I got to find a new co-host. Yeah, I know. Can't, I know. can't say that. But one thing, another thing I wanted to ask was, what was your first business venture that made you money? That was uh, that would have been drop shipping. I drop shipping. Oh, I actually was in drop gosh. shipping too. Yeah, I, I mean, you would watch those videos when you're young. We would have been seven oh, man, grade, man. We know. got we're on the same wavelength. Yeah, literally. Me and a buddy, and you know, you watch those scammy videos. They're like. Yep. Oh, watch how I made 300 grand from home. Yeah. Right. You know, drop shipping and stuff. And so we tried it and it was, uh, we were buying products off of Amazon. Amazon. And yep. then relisting them on eBay, eBay for just a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And drop shipping is always changing years from years. So right yep. now, I think how it's working, correct me if I'm wrong, but guys are most likely buying bulk products from 
China, yep. AliExpress then, or AliExpress, yep, and then selling them on a kind of a Shopify store, acting like it's that's, their own brand. That's the way I did. That's the way I did it. I did that exact okay. same thing. I didn't do the Amazon fate or Amazon eBay method. I did that method, and I actually made a little bit of money. That was honestly my first taste of entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's Dog. what really got me in, into it, and. Every my dad was like, oh, I don't know about it. My friends, I tried getting my friends into it, and they weren't about it really either. I did make a little bit of money, but yeah. I bought a like dog these, collar at dog yeah, I did a, store. I did, com. A, I did a I did a dog store. I did okay. a pet store because I, I don't know. I was trying to research, and everyone loves their animal. Everyone loves their dog, so I did like a dog store, yeah. and it's called Dog Gear Store. And I did all these things, but man. I, I, I did. I made a little bit of money. That was my first taste yeah. of sales and stuff. And I was like, I loved it. I loved it. And I was like, I got I got one more of this. How, I got to ask, how how to end? So I think I just realized, well, I was in high school. Okay. And I wasn't making a ton of money. He thought he was going to put it up there, you know, and he was going to get 20,000 orders. Right. Okay. I watched yeah, those yeah. scammy videos yeah. Yeah. and they're like, oh, it's easy. It's easy. He got five orders. You know, I'd get five okay. orders okay. for 120 bucks okay. and, you know, I made a little bit of profit and then. Well, and then talk, uh, you know, talk about technology. Like when that all started, our local bank called like every day because oh i think there's a fraudulent transaction because you've got a you China know Alex. yeah <laughs> some from this is this is possible spam we're going to freeze your account and you had to be like no that's right and it was like every day and yeah. i finally am like you got to get this figured out because this is this is oh, yeah. not going to work Dang. yeah so i just i just put the i think i threw the wrench in after a while i was like yeah, yeah i probably should probably not do this so we got uh when we ended ours i think it was my buddy he eventually, I kind of got out of it. Did you make he, money too? It was like a hundred bucks. Yeah. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, just, yeah, that's kind of how I was. he ended up going big ticket items, like 500 bucks, and he completely got his crap handed to him. Oh, with, yeah. And he lost like 300 bucks, and he was like, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. So he got out, so. Yeah, it's, it def, I feel like that part of the internet, when, I don't even know, that was like 2017, I feel like, because mm -hmm. when I, 2016, 2017, something around there. Um, that was like where scammers on the internet could make videos and people would, you know, jump in and like think that it's real. But now I feel like you can't really get away with that as much. Cause I feel like on social media now, people just can read that. So, yeah. so easily yep. you can read who's a scammer, yeah. you, you know, everybody, I feel like you can't really be a scammer anymore. Yeah. It's really hard to be because no one's falling for your fake least Lambo yeah. buddy. Can't, yeah. You can't flex on me. I think uh, Naval Ravikant says it the best. He says, uh, the only people, what does he say? The only people uh, getting rich on how to get rich are the people selling you the course. Or yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. How was, your, how was your college experience? Do you think college is necessary? Was it necessary for you? And do you think, what are your overall thoughts on college? I think it was, uh, it was pretty solid. So I went to Iowa State, yep. uh, Ag Biz, and then took a couple of other courses to get economics degree. And so, I don't know, it, you had some really interesting classes, especially in the ag biz at Iowa State. You know, you got into some interesting uh, discussions, a lot of great classes, e just basic econ 101 were awesome classes and stuff. And you meet, met a lot of great people. But as far as the actual return that I got out of it, probably not, probably nothing. Just because I was, every night I was, working on the squad YouTube channel. Right. So like during college, I, I was kind of a weirdo, to be honest. Like I, you were, a, I, you were a lone I, wolf. I didn't have a girlfriend. I never went to a single party. Yep. I could count how many times I drank a beer on my hand. Right. And it was just grind mode. Yeah. Grind every night. And so, yeah, I feel like but you, that's, that's respect though. I'll give you respect yeah. for that. That's, that was all Gary V. And so you guys watched yep. Gary V. That was all, all Gary V. Yeah. Yeah. You were just fired up. You were like, I'm going to make this happen. And yeah. now look at you. You, But you'd found your why. Yeah. So, you know, your experience, I, your experience probably would have been different if you hadn't found your why at that point, because a lot of kids go because they don't, they, they don't, don't know, know and they think they're going to figure it out there. Yeah. You, you'd figured out not necessarily, not necessarily the direct path, but you knew where you wanted to go. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah kind of, it, it kind of, uh, when you have that drive, when you have something you're working for it, it's hard to focus on anything else. Yeah. yeah and it's, so. it, and I mean, 
I don't know. Did you start at your freshman year or did you start it in high school, the squad YouTube channel? I started that sophomore, sophomore year. Sophomore year. So yeah. you started it yeah. started pretty pretty yeah, early. I, I kind of had it locked on. And with YouTube, one of the things you realize is, you know, year two, you're making, you know, say X amount of money, is a day, money a day. And you realize, okay, well, if I just scale this and, and yep. do really good and start posting every day, it's going to scale this much. Right. So, yep. Yeah. So you got the, that's the other thing. If you see the success with yep. it, you saw the success, success, you got those wins, you got that money yep. coming in. You're like, that's the ultimate driver. Once you get those yep. little wins, yep. it's and, like, okay, now I, yeah, I get you. I get why you wouldn't go want to go to party because yep. you're seeing the, you're seeing the wins. Yep. Yeah. And the reach was probably a little better. The organic reach. I mean, at that time. Yeah, that we talk about that. It's it's like any technology. It's like TikTok is right now, or I think TikTok is probably starting to get a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's not they, as good. But you know these these early adopters and these technologies. When you get on them early, it pays yeah, dividends if you figure yeah. out what you're doing. Yeah. I feel like YouTube. You could still pretty. You can grow pretty good on YouTube. Yeah, it's yeah. it's you definitely. Can. It, it's 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 still relevant. I feel like it's a great place for people to go, but. Man, Instagram. I've been trying to grow on Instagram. That's just tough. Their yeah, their they, whole their platform's whole deal is they start out like Instagram in twenty thirteen. They want to get as many people on the platforms as they possibly can. So they make the reach on it crazy so you can grow fast and people get addicted to those dopamine hits of getting the likes, getting new followers, all that stuff. And then they start added ratcheting. adding paid advertising on there. So then you have to pay for to get reach and now they so they want to get as many people on there and then they switch it and turn it into you have to pay to get the attention so they may start making money yeah and that's exactly tiktok's doing the exact same thing now they're getting all these users on here that love tiktok love the reach getting addicted getting so many followers and then they're gonna they're already starting to see it they're starting to pay on advertising and stuff so they're gonna try to monetize the platform but youtube i will say i, I give credit to youtube because they've monetized the platform but they still make it easy. Well, not easy. It's not easy to be a YouTuber, but you can still grow on there relatively right, yeah. good if yeah. you if you put out good content. That's yeah, let's know. talk about that because this is near and dear to my heart. So as a so you're creating content for two channels, mm -hmm. plus you're you're doing all of your other stuff. So what what do you struggle with the most with trying to be wear all those hats and and to be a creator on YouTube? Yeah, it's. Uh when you when you think about it it's like i don't know I, I i come home at night you know from the gym and stuff and it's like okay most people are gonna go watch tv and stuff and it's like okay well i have these four projects i need to work on and do something you have uh the real life channel the squad youtube channel uh the software company or it's even like on my list is just learning more about macroeconomics or watching yep. real vision like you gotta stay up to date with that stuff so it's time just choose one and, do and go it. and realize not everything's going to be perfect. So do you edit your own stuff yeah. as far as what you put up? Yeah. Oh, man. I'm, I'm not, hard. I'm not good at, at hiring people to do tasks like editing or yep. hiring out an editor. I just do everything on my own. I, I'm the same. I'm, I'm we're in the do. same boat. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm at the same place yep. you are because I, I have those conversations myself at night. It's like, I know I need to be, I need to edit a YouTube channel or edit a YouTube video for barn talk. I got to do clips. I got to break down content. I got to make a new YouTube video for this will do. And it can be kind of stressful. I mean, you really got to allocate your time because you can't waste a minute. You yeah. can't waste a minute. That's why you hired me. And now you're terribly disappointed. <laughs> your first, no. your first hire. Dad, dad's done pretty good job so far. He, <laughs> Sawyer, he, Sawyer looks at his window at night when he's editing and all sure my lights, lights are off. Yeah, I want to see <laughs> if the lights on. So you guys live right yeah. across. You can see he each lives, other's houses. I live he lives over in, here and his house is right over here. Yeah. He lives in my old house and I live in my parents' so house. So I was actually going to redo the house he lives in now. That's my grandparents' house where yeah. they used to live. And I was going through there. I tore every all the carpet out. You know, I was doing all this demo work. And my mom, she is a she loves to decorate. Mm -hmm. And my dad's always wanted to live there because you know that was his childhood home. So yeah, it just didn't make it didn't really make sense for us to live there because we've raised our family and we had that house just the way we wanted it. I mean, it really was. It was just the way we wanted it. But that house up there has you know three bedrooms, easy and you know big lot of room, all that and. So we made the, you know, the smart decision, say Sawyer should live there because at some point he's going to have a family. And, and 
thank you for getting it for us. That was much appreciated <laughs> yeah. for doing that work because I would we'd still be getting the carpet out of it if I was right. doing it. Probably. But anyway, we got the floor laid, and we were standing in the kitchen. And my wife, through. my wife got that look, and I was like, mm, "Yep." I said, "You want to live here, don't you?" And she's like, "And she knew that I did, but I tamped that down because it didn't make sense." And she didn't have all I needed was her to say, "Yeah, I'd like to live here." So then we said, "Oh, Sawyer, you like her house?" Of course, that wasn't very smart. It's like you know, not very. Many, give your kid a perfectly good house the way you want it, so you got to go and do. But we love it now. Yeah, it's but yeah, we're, turned out great. I mean, it looks great. I mean, I I would love to live there now too. <laughs> but I literally was like, "You guys just pick, and I'll do whatever." Yeah. You know, it's your decision. So, so that's a five generation. You know, my my dad was actually born in that house, and his his mother was born in that house. And my dad actually died in that house too, because he always said it. His his thing was I was born in this house because they wouldn't yeah. move. You know, a lot of people move to the retirement home and they would not. They just they absolutely would. would not. And he's like, I was born in this house. And I'm going to die in this house, and he made sure that that's how it was. And Trisha informed my, my wife informed me that I will not be doing that under any <laughs> circumstance. But anyway, we got off. We got off. We feel like. Yeah, time is just your time is just the most valuable asset you have. That you have, especially yeah. if you're trying to do so many things, you yeah. gotta yeah. you gotta allocate your time. And I struggle with it too. I need to. We need to hire an editor. You know, mm-hmm. I really need to hire an editor. But it's just it's finding that person that's gonna yep. do it the way you want it to be done. But it's never gonna be the way that you like it. Yeah, and it's a it's a tough deal because on the one hand, if we hired somebody to do the hogs to do to chore our buildings then we'd have more time to do that, but we'd lose the authenticity of us out there doing it. And if we hire an editor, I'm like, I don't know. I'd really like to edit more than I'd like to go load pigs at three in the morning. But it's like, what do you do? Right. So, it's it's a tough place to be. Well, if we're going to, the, the thing that I'm most like jonesing about is I want to talk about crypto. Okay. I want to ask <laughs> one more question. One okay, more question. Yeah. What is your favorite part about being a content creator? What do you like the most out of it? Oh, it's cool. It's really cool. Like before this, there's two kids here. It's really cool seeing people and yeah. stuff that watch your videos. And sometimes you see a eight year old kid and you're like, no way you watch my videos. And I'm like, and then sometimes I'll see like a 30 year old guy that watches yep. the farms in their videos. And I'm like, you actually watch my videos. So it's cool seeing yep. people that watch your videos and enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's, it, yeah, we haven't had very many people come up to us yet, but <laughs> we've had a few. We're, we're big in the Hooterite community. <laughs> yeah. At the World Pork Expo, we we had tables and tables of Hooterites sitting around, and they're all talking, and they're looking, and they're talking, and they're looking, and finally one of them would get up and come over and go, we really like your videos. It's like, Yeah, it's it's a good feeling. I would agree, yeah. definitely. I, lo- I, I do love that feeling. It's pretty nice. We're big in the Dakotas. I'm glad that... Really? <laughs> yeah, we are actually, <laughs> randomly, I guess. <laughs> So the World Pork Expo, you guys yeah. went to that, yeah. And did you have a this will do stand? No, no, no. We we okay. just we just went. Um, so I've gone forever at, because when I was when I was selling buildings, Precision had a booth there, and I had to you know work the booth and smooth people and all that. And then when I worked for Eichelbergers, they of course went. We went up there every year and meet with vendors and all that kind of stuff. So this was the first year for me that I felt like I could just go. And just talk to whoever I wanted to talk to, and um, we're we're doing a one of the sponsors of the of the YouTube channel is a company called Barn Tools, and they've got a product that we use, and um, they actually had their their launch there. launch there, okay. and so we spent a lot of time with them, and that was awesome. Yeah, it was really and, nice. Um, Sawyer had never been, yeah. So well, I went there when I was little, but you know, yeah. walking around all day as a little kid. Talking about pigs, I mean, I was like, mm, la, la, land. So this time it was like, I had a lot of fun. It was a good yeah, time. It was a so good experience. Go ahead on your, ask them all you want to ask them about crypto. Well, this is, so I, I don't know. I'm not going to ease into this because I don't have a good grasp on this. And maybe you do, especially that you have, yeah. you have some knowledge about the mining side of Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. So my other son asked the question, what happens as far as maintaining the Bitcoin network when you get, cause the miners basically maintain the network. Is that correct in saying yep. that? 
So miners maintain the network, and then you also have people running full nodes that are that are kind of the voting protocol the way I see it. Now, as far as being expert technical, I'm not I'm not there yet. I'm still learning yeah. too. So well, the question he asked is you know, obviously as there's less Bitcoin to mine, it gets much diff- more yeah. difficult to mine. But at some point, you're going to get down to there's going to be such a finite amount of coin to be mined that... Miners aren't going to want to mine it. Well, well some will, but, I'm assuming. But um, how does that affect... Like, will the network will the network fail when there's so few people mining? Or will there be enough nodes that the nodes will maintain the network? Yeah, so it's uh, so it, essentially the way it is. So, like you're saying, in 2100 or something. Yeah, we're mining. So right now we're mining uh, 900 Bitcoin a day. I think 6.25 Bitcoin a block. But in 2100, effectively, the Bitcoin price should be at two, three million. To where it, even if you're mining 0.001 of a Bitcoin, that's a lot of US it's, dollar to keep to keep the right. mining incentive going. Yeah. So I. If say we're at twenty one hundred and price of Bitcoin's at thirty k, the network's probably failed by that right. or something. But that's not more than likely. That's so not the nodes happen. keep it going yeah. too, because right. that was the biggest thing. Clay was just like, so if the miners keep the network going and the incentive to mine isn't as great as yeah. it is now, does the network just fail? And yeah, right. you, yeah. the so, nodes keep it going. I guess. So one thing that's happening, if you guys heard about, is the China ban on mining, right? Okay. Yep. yep. Heard about that and stuff. So, we had a twenty-eight percent difficult negative difficulty adjustment, which is. Uh, do you guys know what that is? Like yeah. the Bitcoin. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we had twenty-eight percent, and then now, right now, we're showing in two weeks we're gonna have like another twenty-eight percent adjustment. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Which is crazy. Right now, I checked like before this. So, technically, like me, we're mining Bitcoin, so we've become fifty percent more profitable. Right. Yeah. Right. The Bitcoin adjustment makes it uh, easier to mine those Bitcoin. Right. You're mining right. it faster. Yep. That's yep. Cool. well, that's good so, for you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And what's interesting going into a bull run, and I just realized that this bull run is essentially what happens with Bitcoin is so we we usually hold most of our Bitcoin we mine, but then to pay the electricity expenses in U.S. dollar term, we we sell those Bitcoin. But yeah. as let's see how how this would work as Bitcoin goes up in value in a bull run 20 30k we're actually spending we're actually selling less and less bitcoin right. because those electricity so it's becoming cheaper in bitcoin terms look a lot cheaper yep so that's one thing that adds to a bull run it's a small thing but those bitcoin actually getting produced are are not as many are getting sold actually from the mining perspective um, but oh. there's there's a lot of speculation on what on what actually starts the bitcoin bull run right and i haven't figured it out i've heard a lot of speculation cases because Right now, Bitcoin goes on a bull run, predictably, like every four years. Mm-hmm. Like in August 2020, when we started Bitcoin mining, we we knew there was a good chance Bitcoin in the next 12 months was going to go on a bull run. And it starting in November, it did. Yep. And we might still be in one, too. So Yeah. Okay, so we, we really jumped way ahead. Yeah. How, how did you just decide, you know what? I mean, because you know, I I went down the hole of, I think this Bitcoin's real. I need to I need to like Jumping buy. Up. We need to be buying Bitcoin. Yeah. But it honestly, never like I the idea of mining it just seemed crazy. Crazy. So what snap that you're like? Oh yeah, I think what we're gonna mine this. It and when did you yeah. when did yeah. you make the realization that that's something that you might want to do? Okay, so in 2017. Wow. That's kind of, no, no, that's okay. not my <laughs> mind. 2017 is when I kind of got interested in in bitcoin okay. actually the guy that told me about it was mr beast so, oh sure oh yep i was on a phone call with him me and my childhood friend about some like gambling i shouldn't say this but some gambling site that mr beast was gonna like start because it was insane money maker yeah. and stuff and so i asked about bitcoin he knew all about it like mr. you were on a call with mr beast yeah it was just us three and we were wow we were, how did we you were, swing that he was at like two million subs but wow. we were actually on that call that night we were up to like 3 a.m. I remember I couldn't sleep that night and he was actually we were actually just gambling Bitcoin I forgot what the site was called we were just gambling away Bitcoin we were me and my buddy were gambling like 
50 bucks. He was gambling like 6K a pop and he, he lost it all. Just with you on the call. Just yeah. you three. Just yeah, gambling. It was, That's it was awesome. <laughs> crazy. He was a lot smaller then. Right. But uh, anyways, to get back into it. So in 2020, I was on TikTok and we saw this Bitcoin mining farm in the summer of 2020. So a year ago, we saw this Bitcoin mining farm. And for some reason, we got the feeling that it was in Iowa. We contacted the guy and we we're like, hey, we're big Bitcoiners. We want to just come and see the site, essentially. And so the site's in uh, Grundy Center, yep. Iowa. And so uh, we saw the site. We we're like, okay, well, how do we invest? We're obviously bullish on Bitcoin. And the biggest thing about them is they can't get much capital into them because they can't go to a bank and be like, we want a Bitcoin. Right, right. Like, it is so sketchy. Um, and so very few investors even want to invest in them. And, and uh, so that's kind of how we jumped on. We saw the site. We were like, yeah, let's do it. Let's diversify our Bitcoin uh, position a little bit. And let's start mining some Bitcoin in August 2020. And then uh, put an order in for some miners uh, from Bitmain S9, S19 miners out of China. And uh, those came in in October. And we were mining Bitcoin right in October, right when Bitcoin went on a bull run. That is awesome. Dang. That is awesome. So did you, did you put the miners on his, on his farm yep. to start? Yep. So how it is, is it's uh, what, I don't know what the technical terms are, but they, they're, they're a hosting company. Yeah. So oh, okay. they, they host the mining yeah. for us and then we mine there. So they have oh, okay. two or three technicians that are there daily. And those guys are checking the machines. Making and, sure everything's yeah. running right. And once the month is up, we pay them about 20% of our total profits. To for, just handle to, all that. To run it, handle it, buy those miners. Because those guys, it you can't just go on the internet and buy a like a hundred miners or something. Yeah, like right. That. You can go on eBay and buy like one miner, but those guys had to handle all that, get it all shipped in. So, so far it's been just awesome. Just yeah, passive income. So do you guys sell the Bitcoin that you mine or do you try to keep it? Yeah. So that's interesting. In November, December, when Bitcoin was getting up there, I started selling a little bit because my thought was I wanted to kind of have this passive income, take it and put it and have it fund my software company where I was paying developers and stuff like that. I was like, that's cool. I don't touch anything. I don't take any personal income and do that. But once Bitcoin's price started coming down, I started not selling it. Yeah. So did you buy into Bitcoin in 2017 when you discovered it? Like when was the first time that you bought into Bitcoin? Yeah. You buy in, but very few people go (laughs) crazy bullish and go 30% of the portfolio into it. Right. It was small amounts. So yeah. But you started buying in 2017. Yeah. That's still great though. <laughs> but the greatest opportunity to buy Bitcoin is is when it's cheap. Down twenty eighteen yeah. when everybody's saying it's Did, gonna crash and, and the same thing's gonna happen again. I don't know if Bitcoin's gonna go from thirty K to two hundred K, crash to forty K, but people are gonna say Bitcoin's dead, Bitcoin's failing. It's gonna happen over and over again and those are the times to buy. So yep. when did it crash? Because it was on the run. It was on the run. What did it get to? Like seventeen thousand, or what was it? Eighteen thousand. A little bit below twenty thousand, so like nineteen thousand. Okay. And then it would have been like January tenth. It started its uh, decline down in twenty seventeen. In twenty eighteen. Twenty eighteen. So end of so twenty seventeen. Twenty eighteen. So you bought it when it was right at the top of. I was going in when it was going into a bull run. Yeah. So okay. I was starting to buy Bitcoin at like five thousand, <laughs> but it was still up in that in that <laughs> right. in that bull run. That it was period. still up like. 700 percent after before i bought it right so. and you held it the whole time even yeah, after yeah that. no i i sold i i sold a lot like in 2017 and then i bought back when bitcoin was only down like 40 percent in 2018 thinking yep. that's the bottom so i started dollar cost averaging back in at bitcoin when it was at like ten thousand. it was still falling and then it went all the way to three thousand so yep. i started buying in a little early so I started buying a little late, <laughs> I can, I mean, but I started too. buying, you know <laughs> what? Too. That's the thing. It's like, um, at some point, well, we had a great conversation at world pork with a guy that, um, a little older than us. I'd say he's a little older or he's a little older than you guys, but he's a lot younger than me. But you know, 2017, 2016, he was like, Oh, you know, this is cool. And it went up and he doubled his money. He sold it, mm-hmm. you know, and it was like, oh, he's so happy. Yeah, yeah. And then, it, but it was like going from, I don't even, he told us what, he, I mean, he bought it for like, 
He bought it cheap. Hundreds of dollars. Hundreds of dollars. Right. And it went over a thousand. He doubled his money. He's like, awesome. Sold it. Sold it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then never t- just kind of was like, oh, yeah. Never touched it. And now he he's realizes. In, yeah. And now he's buying. And he's like, I don't own anywhere near what I owned before. Before. Yeah. But I'm like, at, he goes, I just know that at some point I'm going to look back and be thankful that I even bought it now because of where it's going yeah well and it also is a it's a mind it's a change of mind because if you truly believe that that the system that we're in and the fiat currency yeah it's is fiat currency then it's it's a no-brainer and it's i think it's hard for it was this was hard for me because when you look at the value of bitcoin that doesn't mean anything because it's based in, in dollars. Yeah. And when you're on the premise that dollar is really not worth anything anyway. One Bitcoin is always one Bitcoin. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a hard thing, I think, yeah, for to people grasp. to grasp. Yeah. And the thing is, is I we, we talk about buying and selling and doubling money and stuff, but essentially the whole goal is to accumulate more Bitcoin over time. Right. And so usually you see four-year cycles run with Bitcoin where there's a chance to accumulate some more Bitcoin. Yeah. So, Wow, that's that's impressive, man. I will just have to say that's <laughs> that is so cool. But, so right now, though, we're at a six hundred billion dollar market cap. Yep. And when you think about it, Bitcoin's absolutely tiny compared to what it could potentially become as a global reserve currency. So that's, what do you think the ripple effect is when September first comes and El Salvador goes on the Bitcoin standard? How long do you think... Where do you see Bitcoin going in the future? You, you, you don't really... Uh, well, essentially up. Essentially up. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I think yeah. it's going to be... Obviously, I think it beats gold, which is yep. a $10 trillion dollar asset. The question is, does it become some type of global reserve asset where you get into the $50 trillion, $100 trillion, yep. you know? Mm-hmm. Well, that's, I, that's when we talked about it, we didn't think it would be a global. You know, we thought it was just going to be kind of the gold the standard gold. of crypto. Yeah. But now with El Salvador going the route they're going. Well, I think, and it also has become a lot more risky to Bitcoin because El Salvador doing that. So essentially they were using dollars. But all these, all these small countries and all these third world countries that trade in dollars, they're really screwed in an inflationary environment because they're using dollars, but they can't print dollars. Only the United States can print them. And so when we print a bunch of money, it hurts their economy because they've got inflation and they can do nothing about it. Mm-hmm. And that's why El Salvador, I mean, there's many reasons, but that's one of the reasons why El Salvador is going on that. But... I feel like if they if that goes and that rollout goes well, you're going to see some country in Africa do it. And then if that happens, you're going to see another country. Yep. And then you're going to see countries in the Caribbean. You're going to see poor countries around the world. And if you start that, then the dollar's a house of cards. Okay, then the United States doesn't play well with people that, you know, it's like when OPEC thought that they were going to uh, – they were going to quote oil, not in U.S. dollars, and that didn't work very well for them. I mean, it didn't work very well for us in the 70s, but we kind of put our thumb on them and said, no, I think I think you are going to do that or it's not going to. So I don't know how that all plays out. Um, well, yeah, but if you're a third world country and you want to try to get not be a third world country anymore. No, the reason for doing it is to get, it makes, to get ahead and it's smart. It's absolutely. a smart way to do it. I so. just don't know how how it's going to play off, play out with the world powers as far as I don't the world bank is not going to like it well you don't need it the world bank's screwed but all the world banks are screwed I think I think it's in my simple mind I feel like just like China there's not really anything they can do about it because it's it's a world it's so decentralized and that's the beauty of it that it's just going to go where where it's going to go and you can't you can't control it. it. Right. So I don't know. Game theory says that these countries, everybody but the U.S. should technically try to adopt it as a standard to get yeah. off the U.S. dollar standard. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. I think if there's talk of Nigeria, yep. even getting into it, I 
this El Salvador thing, this is big and it'll be interesting to see how does it actually work, right? Sometimes you see, you see promotional videos of it's working great in El Salvador. <laughs> is that actually true? Is that true? That's right. what I want to see. So I do run feel the- like there are going to be a lot of people though that are just going to sit back and just watch how it plays out. Oh no, you I know, guarantee. And if it works good, I think then you're really going to see it get adopted just like how they did it. But if it yeah. fails miserably... And it's just a total disaster. And there's a lot of there's a lot of money on each side, right? Because <laughs> right. there's a lot of money. I there's think a lot of money hoping that it fails going da- down in oh, that country guaranteed. just just to make it fail. Um. So my understanding is they're going to run. It's going to they're going to run it on the Lightning Network. Yes. Is that how yes. they're going to do the transactions? Yes, Lightning Network. Now I tried looking at Lightning Network exactly how it is. Seems like it's another layer on top of Bitcoin. Yeah. I still can't figure out how exactly that Lightning Network transaction works. Good, because I looked into it and I couldn't figure it out. So I was hoping, <laughs> I, I was hoping I that I, you had the answer, but I feel a little smarter knowing that you didn't figure it out. Yeah, I mean, if we can build on layers, so if we can have Bitcoin as the global uh, reserve currency on this slow decentralized layer, and you can build on, you can have Lightning, and then you can add other things. That's, right. That's huge. That's the ultimate. That was the biggest issue with Bitcoin and why yeah. we created Bitcoin Cash is because. It was so slow. So. Right. Yeah, that'd be ideal if they can. I'd love to learn how it all works, but yeah. that'd be that'd be the best best scenario. Yeah. Well, okay, uh, one more thing to add. So you have China that's literally kicking out everything Bitcoin. Yep. But you got this El Salvador, this small country. It's almost be interesting in 50 years to look back if Bitcoin was a thing to see El Salvador versus China. Right. As China just made this, what I think is a terrible move to kick everybody out. China's got, and you should really talk about what uh, Raul said about how people are going to go. It's demographics. People are going to go where Bitcoin is. If if it all works the way that we think it might work with the Lightning work Network, and it's all easy, and it's all the things we hope it is, people are going to go to the countries that incentivize the use of Bitcoin and make it easy. They're going to they're, they're going to invest in those countries. We're on a digital world. We're going to a digital world where you can freelance and you can do all these things you don't need to be at a set place well you can see it you can see it with the mining because the mining's leaving china and a big chunk of it's coming to the united states yeah. Yeah. uh what uh someplace in the middle east like around Tur- some some of it's going to it's right in kazakhstan yep, or yep, something yep, like that okay I, yeah I wish I knew the which i don't know what the connection is but but it's going where it's the most it makes the most economic sense and it's the freest to run is what I'm assuming. Yep. And, but that's the problem with a world economy. China, history is not going to be very good at China. Dem- everybody thinks that they, you know, they're on their way up and they certainly want to try to dominate the world stage on trade, but demographics is against them and they failed miserably and their population is aging so rapidly and they're not going to be able to pull well, it off. There's not enough young people to take over no, the boomer jobs. They're, they're not going to be able away. to pull it off. And their labor rates are, you already see the, the labor's moving. I mean, India is the up and coming. India is going to be where the cheap goods are made, where the cheap labor is. And then beyond that, the next one's Africa. Africa is going to be where the investment is longer term. But eventually, the whole world is going to be developed. And eventually, there will be no cheap labor. That's where technology comes in. And that's where, you know, the stuff we were talking about before we got on here with, you know, what Elon's trying to do and what a lot of people are trying to do. But um, I think that, yeah, what you're, to your point, El Salvador in two decades versus China, I think people will be amazed at, at the contrast there. So, Grant, another question I had for you is how does the mining process work when you're mining Bitcoin, if you can explain that in simple terms and like how much, yeah. how much Bitcoin do you get, you know, or like how long of a period of time does it take to get one Bitcoin mined roughly if you could. Okay. In- so right now we have, what I own is S19, Bitmain S19 amp miners. And those things are kicking out about 0.015 Bitcoin per month on one of those machines. So I don't know what that is in U.S. dollar or whatever, but it's it's really not that, that much. So it takes a while to uh, get them paid back. Obviously, your payback period's gonna adjust based on price and yeah. all that and stuff. But and so 
there's an algorithm. SHA-256 algorithm. And as more coin is mined, it gets more difficult to... Mine it? <laughs> well, to find the the answers because or i guess how what's that what's the miner actually trying to do it's trying to run the sha 256 algorithm and guess a hash so there's this hash function where it's like you the only way to answer to solve the problem is to guess it's that's okay. what like hash is so just randomly to, hits you have, you have to randomly guess and you have to sort you basically have to sort through a bunch of possibilities of check and guess. And wow. then once that once that miner actually gets it, that miner can then prove it and then validate that block to everybody else. And so that's wow. that's the proof that's of work. Crazy. That's the proof of work. Well, that's why it's so difficult to do. Yeah. That's the proof So of work. the blockchain confirms if it's right. So they find the answer, check it with the blockchain. Or is that how that works? That's, I'm assuming. that's getting pretty technical. I'm not sure. If, I think it's the miners that will then verify that that oh, sure. block is real. Okay. I think. Wow. I'm not too technical into it. I Well, you're more, more technical miners, than most. I am. I, well, you know, we need to get on to other questions. I, I love this subject. We could, we could probably, if you, ever, if you ever get bored, which I know you won't, I would have you back to just do an entire podcast on nothing but crypto because yeah, I, yeah. I I'm love so with it. I love it. I love it too. Um, but you know, this is an example. What you're doing, it's one of those things where, at some point, you you sat and you thought about it, and you looked you looked into the future, what you thought the future was going to be. And I'm sure you had to deliberate before you made the investment to do it. Or maybe sometimes it's, it's easier because we've made some good decisions where we're like, ah, let's just try it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. usually there's a lot of thought that goes into it. Yeah. But so much, of, so much of making a good investment in hindsight is time spent just, just absorbing information Yes. If you can find the information, and that's the beautiful thing about the time that we live in, is the, all that information is out there. If you just spend the time and get the different points of view and just think about and it. At, at the point when you were investing, when you first bought Bitcoin, and you said in 2017, at that time, I mean, the amount of people that were Very high few. on Bitcoin, yeah. so low, and yet yeah. you took the took the time to find the information and you took the bet and you said i believe in bitcoin and i'm doing it and yeah. that yeah. you know that takes some that take yeah. that's that's what it's all it about right there. Yeah. that to takes do. some balls it, to do to be fair it was a learning curve it wasn't like uh bitcoin's gonna be amazing so you did like your that. research it was, it was every I, in my opinion everybody goes down through the exact same rabbit hole yep of maybe buying a little bit, learning, 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 buying some more, and then maybe they see a really big opportunity. And for, for me, that was in 2018, kind of a big opportunity. So it wasn't like crazy. I'm crazy, crazy bullish. It was just like, okay, let's allocate a little bit. Right. And that's what you're seeing with uh, even billionaires. You're seeing Ray Dalio, Howard yep. Marks. Um, everybody go through it. First, they doubted it, yep. and then they buy a little bit. And uh, oh, who's the bond king? What's his name? Stanley Drunkenmiller is yep. even starting to get bullish on Bitcoin. And yep. And that's kind of crazy. But back to your point, I mean, when you really think about investing, I'm 23, I don't know anything. I've, you know, I don't, I really don't know much, but all it is, is essentially listening to as many point of views as possible yep. on a certain subject, like you said, and hearing them debate and then kind of making up your own opinion about how it's going to turn yeah. out, I guess. And then betting on yourself on that decision and whatever it is, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, and, and we, we talk about this. And I wish I would have learned this a lot younger. And you are gonna you're gonna benefit from this. But <laughs> here we go. Torque well, talk. there came a point. There just came a point where, and I was guilty of this. I went through life, and people that were supposed to know about whatever it was, you asked them what they thought, and they told you what you should do, and you said, "Oh yeah, okay, right. I did it," and you never questioned it. And I'm not gonna beat on anybody specific okay i'm going to beat on financial i'm going to beat on the financial people because so many people think 
that their financial future is so complicated that they need to hire an expert, an air quote expert, to do it. And I'm not saying that you don't, and this is not financial advice. Not financial advice. We need to advice. get that this big whole podcast disclaimer. is not yeah. financial <laughs> advice. But Grant, I, I, is this financial advice? No. <laughs> no. Okay. And I feel like, and this, and this is just for me, but at some point, I asked a question that the answer I got, I didn't, I just, I didn't feel like that was the right answer. And I started, that was what sent me down the hole of absorbing information that, that I could find, which is, you know, readily available if you go digging for it. And I made my own conclusion. And once you realize that anybody that you ask for advice on anything, their advice is only as good as the information that they got or the person that told them what they know. And we're all kind of in the same boat. And when you take responsibility that, okay, I need to do my own research, I don't care if you're talking about, I don't care if you're talking about your financial future or... Um, your nutrition, your fitness. Yeah, yeah exactly. Any anything. of those things. When you take responsibility for that, that's a powerful thing. Um, because you you realize that there's a lot of things that you might have thought were really com- and there there's things that are still complicated. I, there's so many things I don't understand. But when you take responsibility for that and that you take the responsibility to learn for yourself, that's a that's a powerful that's a powerful well, yeah, tool. It's risky. That's the biggest thing I yeah. think people look at it, is it's risky. I'm taking all the responsibility of doing it, and then I have no one else to blame if this if this messes up. But also, if you do invest in something, you did all the research your own, yourself, right. and it pays off, then it feels damn good. It does, it does feel does good. Feel damn good. That's the part. That's the hardest part with it. But I totally agree. You, you got to do your research. And nowadays, clearly, we're it's saying so with, easy. We're saying with the, this whole, you know, this whole table. You did your research. You've done your research on Tesla. I've done my research on numerous things, and you can find it easier than ever before to find your own research. So research people, if you're looking yeah. rant over, yeah. this is not financial so, advice, by the way, to get a little more specific. So like Torque, you watch real vision a lot, yeah. which I think is absolutely it's great. the best. It's just macroeconomics, which maybe isn't for everybody, but you can learn so much for, I don't know how much, I think some of it's free even Yeah, stuff. So I'm watching just podcasts, YouTube videos, and then Twitter even is awesome to learn on. If you're following the right people, we talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, When you think about in the past, traditionally, the think about the amount of the value of the education that you have gotten watching real vision. It is a bargain. (laughs) I mean, it is a bargain. You couldn't, there is no college. college, There is no college in that I know of that you could go that you could get anywhere near the amount of knowledge that you're getting for that real vision and this is i'm not being i wish i wish if real vision would like to support the podcast <laughs> and sponsor the market update uh call raul, me raul give us a, give but us a i'm call. saying it is a and that's just one example there's a lot of great places to get info well, but that's the age we live in mm-hmm. information it is it's millions of dollars you're stealing it yeah, you're stealing it. It's a steal. Yeah. There's millionaires and billionaires with personal brands giving out free value yeah. of how they became wealthy. It and they're is. just giving it away to people to watch. But they know in doing that that not very many people are going to actually do the steps necessary to do it. They understand True. that. They're doing True. it, but they understand not everybody's going to do it. But it's all out there. Yeah. You've literally just got to go find it. You literally just got to go find it. One specific thing I want to give a plug is uh, Naval Ravkin. Have you heard? Yep. Yes. Loved his podcast. He was about, one of the first, okay. one of the first you, podcasts you it, we listened you've, to. You've listened to his long podcast on how to get rich. How to get rich without getting lucky. Yep. So yes. Amazing. In, Amazing. Like May of 2018, yes. a thread, and then he went in depth, and it's just a three-hour podcast. So good. And I try to listen to it three times a year and just while I'm mowing, just listen yeah. over and I over listened again. to it while I was mowing too. And it is, <laughs> or running. So good. It's just three hours, and you think you could go by 40 years without thinking about this. And now that you have, have listened to that, it's like, okay, now I can kind of focus on what I need to focus on. That, and That honestly is one of the greatest podcasts It changed. Ever. It yeah. changed. It really does. Highly Should, recommend it if anybody's yes. just trying to get into it. That is, that is a great podcast for anybody that wants to change their mindset on how to be wealthy and like 
I mean, it well, really just, will change it, your life. It, it really applies, will change your it, mindset. It applies to so much in life. Yeah. Great source, Grant. That was awesome. Okay. That is the topic on Bitcoin and investing. I'm, we got our fair share in there. For today. For today. We may have to have Grant back on and just strictly <laughs> yeah, talk about crypto. But my biggest question, I think everybody was, you know, wanting to, wanting to know is how did you become a first generation farmer? You know, you like, it's just absolutely, it's, it's so impressive, all the stuff you're doing. But that to me is one of the biggest and greatest accolades you have so far just because it's so hard to be a first generation farmer so hard to get in and do it and i mean that's kind of a that's kind of a hard question to answer because there's so many parts that went into you yeah. doing it but if yeah. you could sum it up yeah it was so it was either well obviously you wanted to start farming so it was either you could start farming by renting ground or something like that or my whole goal was to eventually get enough capital to kind of make it easier because yep. you could make it super hard on yourself and, and, and start it's doable. And there's a lot of guys that do it, or you can make it a little easier on yourself and put a lot of the hard work up front of getting the capital and then going into farming. Uh, that was kind of my thing. And so uh, all of you didn't, you just didn't, you did not want to be that highly leveraged. Yeah. 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 It, and I think another thing that people want to like, people fear that they're not like, did you know how to farm? Like, yeah, yeah I, you, it's it's like when you're addicted to something, you've you've, you've found done little the ways to learn. He played farming simulator. Right. <laughs> oh, he's a pro at it. Come on, I have like two thousand hours on there. Yeah, right. Okay, because I feel like that might be somebody's. A lot of people say they go to an older farmer and then they learn how to farm and then they, you know, hopefully he rents it to you for being the hired hand. But yeah, you, it, to your point, if you love it, you'll you'll learn how to do it without actually, you know. So people are, are here to listen to you, but I'll give you a good farming analogy. So uh, a friend of my brother's from Texas asked me, well, how do you know, how do you know, like when to do any of that? How do you know what you're doing, you know, farming? And I'm sure he was wanting like a, a good answer. And I told him, I said, well, it's really pretty easy. In the spring, we just go out in the afternoon and we get our chores done and we drive around. And when we see somebody out, in their field, you know, like with a field cultivator, we come home, go, well, heck, I, it, it must be about time to go till. <laughs> so we get the tractor out and hopefully the battery's not dead. And and then we do that. And then, you know, it might rain, it might get cold, it might get hot. And then we go out and we drive around and go to town and get a pop. And lo and behold, there's somebody out there with a planter. And we're like, well, gosh dang, Sawyer, it must be time to plant. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> Just looked. He just looked at me like, well, I think he realized I was. <laughs> I think he realized that I was kind messing of with him. Yeah, kind of messing with him. But I wish it was that easy. Just well, that's all that. we really do. Yeah, yeah, just go to town. Just you just got to drive around, and see what's going on. That's all it is. Too. All yep. that's all there is. Well, to. everybody does have that one neighbor that does all the hard work for you. Like they're the dedicated guy. They got the thermometer in the ground. They're checking the soil temperature. You know they they got her all figured out and you just watch that guy because you know you figure when he's ready to go that's the optimal time to go there you go all right i'm sorry i got (laughs) got in the way so what advice would you give to someone that wants to become a first generation farmer if you give any piece of advice what's the biggest one yeah i i'm no expert on this but i would say uh when you're thinking about it there's obviously a lot of thinking that has to go on years ahead of how you're going to get into it and consider well there's a lot of good information out there. Like, uh, I know Gavin Spore. Have you seen that yep, guy? Yep. Popcorn yeah. Popcorn farmer. guy. He needs to start a YouTube channel. He does, he does. He does. Or Clark Farms. Or There's yep. a lot of guys that have good information yeah. about it, but it seems like the easiest, there's two different ways you could do it. I, I did a way of kind of putting the hard work up, getting capital and stuff and going into it. Or you could start by running farms and kind of going out there. That's, I don't know the best way to do that. It would be, if you really love it, you're going to find a way to right. go and rent some farms and start knocking on. That's where it gets tough of running, running ground and finding a way in. Cause maybe you can piss off some people too, by right. stealing some ground, a kid just coming in. Right. I don't know. So when you, you were, have a good idea of how to get started better. <laughs> so did you can, cons- so do you grow, are you a conventional, do you grow conventional crop? Yep. You don't do any specialty stuff, non GMO stuff or anything like that. Yep. Just regular corn and beans yeah so did you consider going down the road of niche no like gavin you know doing something like that not at all not at all i wanted it to be as easy and simple as possible and 
uh, I wanted to be kind of like my family where I grew yep. up and just corn and beans simple. Yep. I know right. there's definitely opportunity in uh, niche stuff and stuff. Yeah, right. I agree. You know, it's, the, it's the most fun to, look, to do yeah. conventional. I mean, who doesn't love it? If you, if you do it, you love it. So I don't blame you. And farm Simulator, I'm sure that's what you do a lot of that. Oh, yeah. So On Farm Simulator, can you put a hog building on your farm? Yes. Yeah. You can, you really? Can. Is right. that a mod yeah, or is that like an actual... Because I, I heard there's mods. You got to yeah. like mod it. Mods are what make Farming Simulator great. You can... I think in game without a mod you can do a hog building, but I know there's hog building mods in there. Too. That's how you win at Farm yeah. Simulator. You start you building hog buildings. Crap you start building hog, hog buildings. Yeah. That's no, the that's secret. The, that's the way I do it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what are the biggest struggles you found so far as a first gen farmer? I would say the it's 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 I don't know pretty easy for me, but one of the weirdest things kind of going into it is. So I'm not from the actual local community I'm farming in. So sure. you go into an area and you just start buying ground. Keep in mind, the first farm I bought was up for sale for a year. It's Nobody ugly, wanted it. Ugliest farm in the county. Nobody wanted it. So people, it probably won't make any neighbors mad. But then I started buying two other farms kind of around the area. And it's just like, you don't, not that neighbors are mad or anything, but you just don't know any of the neighbors. And right. It makes it tough. Thoughts and there's a new guy stopping in every day to talk to you about he's from the local neighborhood and everybody's nice, but it's just like, till you leave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Yeah. So you, they, they come up to you and talk you so nice to you. So you started out away. and you were, you were harmless and they're like, boy, that crazy kid, you see that crazy kid <laughs> bought that farm. Boy, that's Yeah. I feel sorry for him. And then when you buy something that's decent, like that son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I feel bad for him. <laughs> Oh, it man. turns on a dime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who does he think he is? Well, but you're so you're an example because there's a there's a saying a lot I've heard this said many times that you know you can go buy a chunk of farm ground um, three counties away easy, but you can't buy one across the road, and that's so true because it's hard. It's definitely um, hard. There's so I mean it's like everything. There's so much. There is politics like you wouldn't believe in every community and it is it's well it's hard to buy a farm but it's hard to find a farm for sale to buy and i've heard that said many times guys you know that farm um from one farm quite a ways away from their home and when you ask them about it's like it's the only place that we could expand because we couldn't buy any ground around here yeah and i mean that's just the that's just the nature of the beast where do you keep your equipment at. it's outside in the or organic shed just sitting outside gravel lot yep now it would have been my newest video i posted i'm actually working on getting a shed built here so back That's good so is that where you're why you're mowing down the corn yeah, yeah, okay yeah, i was yeah, wondering yeah. what that, you were doing yeah and mowing down the corn i posted like an instagram story mowing yeah down corn it it pissed off so many <laughs> oh i bet i was <laughs> so many people I bet it did. this guy's got so much bitcoin he's just out <laughs> mowing his corn down because he doesn't want to have to harvest this fall he's like ah it's too much work i'm just gonna mow it down mining bitcoin yep. don't need this <laughs> yeah and it was mainly just kids and stuff but i just had to explain to them it's like seven or eight here box of corn yeah. going down we, we want to chill this building chill up. guys and you guys oh. you guys mowed down corn the hog yeah for yeah, the hog did. Yeah, yeah we did we did do that i forgot about yeah, that that's right it was in the way yeah. though now, how many to... acres do you take out i wasn't it was less than an acre, an acre. Okay. It, it wasn't even close because we we had anticipated that we were going to get started in that like in july, july probably and so we rough figured out we didn't plant the corner of that field okay. because we didn't figure that we thought we were going to get started earlier. But then when the dirt guy showed up, we had to do, we it. hadn't figured how far out we were going to have to pile the dirt. And so we had to go mow down a little bit more, but it really wasn't that much. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's funny because I had a guy when I was selling hog buildings, I had a guy up by, uh, Oh, Brandon, Iowa, I think is the closest little town. South, northeast, northwest Iowa? No, um, right off of, right off, right off of uh, I-380, head, like Walker. Okay, okay. Up by Walker, Brandon, I can't remember what else the other little towns are there. But anyway, um, he, we sold him two 1,200 head sheds and we were looking for some place for our concrete guy to go because there was a deal... There was a building that didn't go. Anyway, I called him and I said, hey, 
you know, we can be there, you know, in a week to start your pit. And he's like, ah, he's like, cause we weren't going to start it till fall and beans were turning, but they weren't anywhere near ready to pit, to cut. And he's like, oh boy, these beans really look good. And beans were high that year. And he's like, I really hate to mow these beans down. I'm like, well, if you want to get this thing started, you're going to have to mow these beans down. He's like, you better show up. <laughs> that guy that we saw yep. at the pork expo. And then, uh, it rained up there and it didn't rain down in northern Missouri. So we sent our concrete guy down there and then it dried, you know, it dried up quick and he calls me and I'm like, well, it's probably going to be two or three weeks. Sawyer knows I see this guy every year at the World Pork Expo. That's been like 10, 12 years ago. And every time I see him, all he knows me of is, you're that son of a, you know, <laughs> you still owe me for those beans. I mean, it's like every year. It's that yeah, is a said, thorn he, in his eye. He said it to you this it, year, too. Is it aggressive or is he? Just, no, he just okay, wants yeah. to bust my He's balls about it. Looking at you. But sure. yeah, it made an impression on him. So <laughs> yeah. So what's your, what's your favorite? Now that you, now that you're, you're doing it, um, what do you enjoy the most? Yeah, I, uh, so are you a guy, so are you a guy that you, are you going to be one of those guys that when, when I can get a, when you can get a auto steer six row planter to plant it for you, are you going to be like, nah, I really like being out there doing it. That's good. That's going to be tough. Yeah. yeah. You enjoy doing it. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Planting. Planting was fun. It, so, so I only planted 250 acres tillable, but right. that was a lot. It felt like yeah. my first 85 acres, it took me end of one day, all of the other day, and then into the next day. And I'm like, like, that's a lot. So, uh, like planting even was a grind. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was fun. You enjoy it and yep. stuff. It's Go. great. The first day, you know, yeah. like field work's always great. The first it really does. It's like, it's sort of that period where it's like, yeah, we're in the fields. Let's go. Yeah. It's so exciting. And then you, you love, get, you know, and then you get like two days, three days. You're like, all right, this is dragging. Let's, let's get it going. Yeah. And you know, the guys that we don't farm, right. We right. don't farm we don't, that much yeah. ground, but right. you know, the guys that farm a lot, it truly is a grind yeah. because, oh, yeah. um, you know, the longer you're at it, the maintenance, the maintenance starts, and all the stuff that goes wrong and all the stuff that you didn't, then the weather, it gets strung out. We, we're all very blessed. The technology is unbelievable because I grew up, when I was a kid, we had a four row, 495 pull type John Deere planter with the, with the disc. You know, when you went and got seed corn, you got a set of discs that went in the planter for the seed size, because depending on what, how big the seed was, that's how big the notch disc was that went in the, and, um, you know, to go from that to today, it took us, I mean, I think we, I think it took us like a month. I can remember starting because you plowed, you harrogated, and then if it rained and it got crusted, you harrowed it again, and then you might roll it if it got clotty. And then we went out and we planted it. And I mean, it took forever. Yeah. It took yeah. a month. Wow. And then as soon as it came up, well, you better start cultivating. And we talked about this in the last podcast. My brother, my oldest brother, was the only one that could cultivate because my dad, we had a front mount, uh, four-row cultivator on a John Deere 60, and he set those uh, sweeps out so far because he wanted to make sure that you got every inch, you know, cultivated that I couldn't drive straight <laughs> enough to not take out corn. And plus... I about fall asleep and my oldest brother was the only one that could do it. When I came along, my dad was like, I can't afford to have you cultivate. (laughs) So, but anyway, it's changed so much. Now we get done. We basically, we plant all the corn in one day and we plant all the beans in one day. Pretty much. It's it's all no till, no Mm -hmm. cultivating and stuff. Yep. Yeah. And the, and my dad would just be, and he was amazed. Like when we first started no tilling the yield that we got, he never raised corn that good, you know? He, well, yeah, it's he just, never, but it he never didn't crossed have crossed their mind to even do it that way right. either. I mean, but crazy. he didn't have hog manure and he didn't have the right. genetics and he didn't right. have 1197 and you know, 1197. I planned some of that against some it's a great uh, number riffles this year. Did you? That'll it'll be, be good. It'll be interesting. So they're trying to, you know, pioneer. They're they're always on to the next thing, and so this year we don't have near as much 1197 as we have in the past. But it's been that's been that's a, a, cru- that always a crush. It just is a great. 
Heck, you know, we didn't, it didn't rain. We didn't have rain for I don't know how long last year, and it still went over it was 200. the best number still. Yeah. I mean, it was just it crushed it. Now, do you have problems with ears dropping? I, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's not enough to – not enough to – Throw off yield. It still out yields – it still yields better. All the other numbers. But, um, yeah, you definitely want to use fungicide on it. You definitely want to use fungicide on it. I didn't do that this year. Well, no? it's not tasseled okay. yet, is it? No. No. Yeah, have them come in okay. and spray it. Okay. Oh Just God, you shouldn't take advice from me. <laughs> this is not farming we use, advice. <laughs> I I've pretty much got to the point. I use fungicide every year because okay. for me it pays every year. How's your corn look? It's it's, it's looking good. good. Yeah, on the newest video I did kind of a Update. tour of it and stuff, but we got dry. Like it was pineapple. Was yeah. it pineapple here? Yes, it was. Yep. Okay, and then we got super lucky with like five six inches of rain in mid June. We were worried it was gonna. Just burn up, burn up, really completely. Yeah, we got super dry. We were praying and praying. We were like, oh. and then we prayed a little too hard, and it started raining. raining and, and then we didn't think it was going to stop. Yeah, but it's but, but the last this yeah the month of June was great. I mean, it would rain, sunshine, rain, sunshine, rain, sunshine. There was a period when it was just rain, strictly yeah. rain, but then it, the sun started to come out finally. So, do you have you tissue sampled any? Have you done that before? No, no, no. I was wanting to. I never did. So yeah. this is the first year I've done it. Okay. And and I'll tell you, I'll tell this story. This is like a unicorn. You, this will never happen again. And I don't know who you use to get your fertilizer through and all that, but this is a true story. I got tissue tests on my corn and sent them in through my fertilizer guy. And he calls me and he says to me, I got your samples back and everything looks good. I don't think I would put anything on. Because we were talking about putting like a micro pack. Boron's big on corn on corn. They think that really helps. And we were thinking about adding that when we spray fungicide on, when we fly it on. And he said, I don't think you need anything. I said, what? And he's like, no, I, I think you're okay. Usually they're trying I said, to get everything that are you feeling all right? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, yeah, why? I said, I hope you're by yourself because if anybody else hears you telling somebody they don't need more fertilizer, they're going to fire you right on the spot and escort you out of the building. He just laughed. I'm like, that will never happen. I've never heard a fertilizer guy go, you know, it's always like, oh, yeah, well, you could add this or that or whatever. But I think so we're just going to let year. it roll. It'll be a great year for farmers. So you guys didn't side dress at all or anything? No, we side dressed. No, we side oh, dressed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So we put on... We, we did put a micro pack on when we, we side dress. Okay. Yeah. So we we put, put on boron, zinc, yep. um, and then we we always use sulfur. sulfur. So our our fertility plan is basically we put on, depending on what our analysis is on hog manure, we put on roughly about 4,000 gallons of manure because you'll get about, you'll get between 45 and 55 pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 gallons. Okay. And so we're, we're putting on close to 200 pounds. But that's a little bit misleading because manure, not 100% of that is Use available the first, the first year. Okay. Um, so we do that and then um, we'll put on, We'll put on maybe maybe thirty pounds with a spray after we after we um, plant, and then depending on how it looks, we'll come back and side dress. And this year we decided to side dress, and when we did, we I think we put forty pounds 40, on. 50, I well, remember. I think we put forty on the corn on bean ground, and I think we put fifty, 50 on, on the corn on corn. corn on corn. And we did we we put in. This is the first year I've done micro boron pack. and zinc or whatever. It's a micro pack. Um, but man, it looks good and it's the hot, you said it's the hot item this year. Well, yeah. So this is another, uh, wit offs will like me telling you this, but so we went to a pioneer deal and the agronomist was talking about corn on corn cause we plant half our acres of corn on corn. And he was talking about the challenges of trying to get yield out of it. And he said, one thing that they found in all the tests that they've done is usually the best doing corn on corn is not deficient in boron. And most, most corn is. And so I call, call my fertilizer guy and I literally said, Hey, I said, what do you know about boron? And I didn't even get boron out. And he's like, Oh, you need it. You need it. You're short. I guarantee you're short. And I'm like, well, why haven't you told me about it before? Well, nobody ever wants to spend any money, but you're short. I guarantee you need it. What do you need? Micro pack? Because if you're going to do that, you need zinc too. I got just what you need. Don't worry about it. We'll mix it in when you side dress. Yeah, we'll put it on there. I was like, oh, okay. Those guys, I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, they're, they're there. There's no scenario that you don't need more fertilizer. Yeah. Besides, 
Well, except for yeah. this. Now I'm, I'm wrong. Is that for the, the first time the ever? The first time ever because it's like if corn's cheap, oh, man, you need every bushel you can get. Now's not the time to skimp on your fertility program. And if corn's high, oh, man, you only need like a bushel. Like a bushel <laughs> will pay for this micro. I mean, you'd be crazy not to put more on. I'm like, you guys have got it made. They got post sales yeah. pitches. They got the it. They got it ready. So There you go. Anyway. Well, is the heat rising in this barn yeah, or what? We're it's sweating. Hot. It's getting hot for sure. That's why we're trying to shoot him in the morning. But I guess the last question I want to ask was just what's next for Grant Hilbert? What do you got coming up? Yeah. What's what's on the rise for you? Anything exciting yeah, that you want to let people uh, know? Yeah, we're so I'm working on a software company right now. I got to keep it private. Otherwise, uh, I just got to keep it private. Yep. But uh, just a software company uh, in the next couple of months, probably be announcing it and stuff. It's... Uh, I'm trying to think. That's all he can say. Yeah, That's all he can, yeah, all he yeah, can yeah, say. Yeah. Stay tuned. Like that guy that does that and stuff. Right, but, but I've been putting a lot of time into it over the past year and stuff. And uh, in the middle of summer when I sit on the computer all day and work on it and stuff. Yeah. So. so you're excited. That's, that's Super your excited. Yeah. A couple yeah. months, your, your viewers are going to know. Oh, yeah. All, all right, right. All right. It'll be fun. Do you have any question for us? Is there anything you want to know? Don't feel obligated. I just, I just pulled the pomp. Yeah. I pulled the pomp card. I could ask him if he believes in aliens, I was but say, I'm not yeah. going to ask that. So this will do farm. Eventually, do you want to do hogs forever? Or do you, if the opportunity was there, would you just go strictly grain? I think we'd always keep the hog barns. Yep. If we, I don't know if we would do all the work that's required to do all the pigs. Uh, no, we wouldn't. No, we would hire it done <laughs> and then strictly... Strictly grain farm. We loaded <laughs> pigs last night, and I tell you, I I like loading. I do like loading pigs, which is kind of weird. Um, yeah, he but likes I was them on the it. truck. He really likes okay. putting. Them I on want the truck. every one of those pigs to know that I won. That's what I want to know <laughs> because most people don't realize pigs are like convicts. They got nothing but time to lay around and dream up ways to screw you over. So every time that we sell them, I want them to know I won, boys. I won. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I love, I think we both, they've been a great, well, it's how we've managed to keep this thing keep this going. thing going. In this day and age, we farm 400 acres, and the only reason that there's another generation here is because of the hog buildings, and I think we'll do that as long, now I think that's going to look a lot different in 20 years mm -hmm. than it does today. I, I don't know, but nothing stays the same, but I think we'll always... We've all there's a benefit to animal agriculture. I mean the fertilizer part of it. Yep. Um, but we would. I mean I'm just like everybody else. I'd like to grow the farm, and I th we have to grow the farm for him to be able to raise his kids. Yeah. yeah. So that's the number one goal. That's the biggest goal. We want to go out and get acres. Yeah. You know, yeah. like everybody does. But like he said, hog barns is what's given us the opportunity to do that. And I I, I enjoy the work, but do I want to keep doing it forever? No, I'd like to ideally right. hire somebody to help us out with that side of it so I could grain farm because, to be honest, I love grain farming more than I do love hog farming. Yeah. And I do love it probably because it's seasonal. You don't right. get to do it all the time. As, it's special. And, you know, hog farming, I'm been there every single day doing yep. the same thing every day, you know. So it's different, but, it, you know, I've done so many turns of pigs that I know what I got to do. So, But I would say I equally love today – doing the other things we do. Yeah, I like love this, this right here. Yeah. This is the, great. The people that, that social media has allowed us to meet, just like you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. heck, we didn't know who you were. <laughs> right. And it's and it's just, it's it's deals like that and um, so much opportunity. I think the thing, the biggest thing that I've gotten out of the last two years is just the, the opportunity that's out there. The hardest part really is it all comes down to deciding what are you going to spend your time at? Because and then just going there's a million it. things that we'd like to do. It's just what is the th one thing to focus on today, right? Yeah, yeah that's for sure. So I think we're going to wrap it up, everybody. Uh, again, follow Grant on social media. Follow his squad YouTube channel. Follow his personal Grant Hilbert YouTube channel. Um, follow him on Instagram, the squad, or is it, what is it? The squad, the squad underscore YouTube. The squad Something. underscore YouTube, you know, give them a follow because I think this is a very valuable episode. I think we dropped a lot of knowledge bombs, especially about Bitcoin. And I hope he gave you some insight on, you know, how you could become a first gen farmer in 2021. So that being said, hope you guys have a great rest of your week. and We'll see you back next Friday. Uh -huh.